uh, introduce you with uh, many changes that have occurred uh, during the last months in uh, uh, in the GDAL project and libgeotif uh, libraries uh, regarding how coordinate reference systems uh, are handled. And to be short, I will abbreviate it as CRS. So CRS is coordinate reference system. Uh, so first, have a look uh, at the how the situation was before uh, regarding uh, how CRS and coordinate uh, operation dictionaries were handled. So you have probably all uh, heard about the EPSG database, uh, which is a database of CRS and their transformation, which is published by uh, IOGP uh, every few months. So they release uh, that database uh, in a number of formats, and uh, for example, like a PostgreSQL uh, database dump. So before we had this situation where in libgeotif, uh, there was a, a Python script uh, that would uh, uh, import this database uh, in uh, PostgreSQL and then do a few requests, reprocess it, extract transformation from the CRS to WGS84, and uh, dump that in a, a few custom CSV files. The CSV files were used by libgeotif, and then someone would copy the CSV files into GDAL, and GDAL has its own logic to parse the CSV files and reconstruct CRS subject from them. Uh, and GDAL has another Python script that would uh, parse the CSV files and uh, export the CRS definition as a uh, as proj strings, you know, like this stuff, proj, he called UTM and 31 datum WGS84. So, quite messy. <laughs> and uh, actually, the, the bus factor for this whole process was two people, uh, myself and Howard Butler. <laughs> but most annoying, uh, you realize that there are three different versions, potential versions of the EPSG database. So, depending on the tool you used and uh, how recent it was, you could have different versions of the PSG database. And so that was quite a mess because you got different results and it was really hard to figure out why. Uh, ah, and you will notice that we don't have logos for Proj and LibGeotif, so please contribute logos. <laughs> so when you want to transform coordinates between two CRS, I found that it was a bit like this famous movie by Sergio Leone, the, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And be reassured, if you haven't seen it, I won't spoil it, I promise. <laughs> so let's start with the good. So it's this simple situation where you want to transform between two CRS that use the same geodetic datum. Uh, for example, you want to transform from a UTM projection to the geographic version using uh, the WGS84 datum, for example. And this is a simple case because uh, it's an exact operation from a mathematic point of view. It's really well defined. You can get an accuracy to the nanometer level or even better sometimes. So this is yeah the good situation. And now you have the, well, the ugly one, or maybe in Italian, il brutto. It's described better the subtlety of it. It's when you want to transform between CRS that don't use the same geodetic datum. So here yeah, I took the example of New Zealand, where you have this old New Zealand 49 uh, datum, and you want to transform to the new version, the 2000. And in the EPSG database, uh, you have a direct, you have actually two direct transformation from, from that, but until Proj 6, we didn't have the logic to do this direct transformation. So we had to go every time through WGS84, which is called the early binding approach. And so each time when you uh, accumulate transformation, you accumulate inaccuracies. So in this process, the first uh, transformation has a, uh, a maximum accuracy of one meter, and the second one, also an accuracy of one meter, so depending if you sum up or um, take the max of them, you, you add finally a, a one meter or two meter in accuracy, whereas if you had be able to use a direct transformation using a, a grid, you could have a 20 centimeter accuracy. So 
clearly that was something suboptimal. But if there are people from New Zealand in this room, they will say that it's a bad example because actually, if you look at this second transformation, it's a null transformation because uh, the uh, New Zealand 2000 datum is considered at some epoch to be equivalent to the WGS84 datum. So in that particular case, yeah, the brutal approach was not that bad. And actually it was not that bad for a, a number of situations. But now I will come to the bad. And there are a few bad situations, like when you want to transform between the Japanese datum 2000 to the new version, the 2011, the one that was uh, created after the uh, earthquakes that led to the Fukushima catastrophe. And in that case, uh, you have a transformation between uh, the 2000 datum and WGS84, but you don't have one between WGS84 and the 2011 version. So the early binding approach didn't work. And here you really need to, to use a late binding approach where if you take the northern part of Japan, the one where the earthquake occurred, you have a correction grid. And uh, for the southern part of Japan, it's, it's a null transformation because the, the datums are the same. And another bad, uh, I like taking example far from Europe, so it reduces the, the chance that people can contra contradict <laughs> me. Uh, so this one is for Australia. Uh, and so they have this uh, GDA 94 datum, which is the yeah, old new datum of <laughs> Australia, and the uh, newer one, the GDA 2020. Uh, and here it's really bad because GDR 94 was considered to be equal to WGS 84 in 94, and GDR 2020 is going to be considered as equal as WGS 84 in 2020. So in the EPSD database, you have null transformation for both steps. So if you use a two-step approach, you get a zero shift at all, whereas in the meantime, uh, Australia has moved by one meter uh, and 80 centimeters to the northeast. So clearly here we need to use a direct transformation. So yes, we, we had really a need to, uh, uh, to modernize uh, the CRS management in the, the CC++ ecosystem and uh, with the help of Howard Butler to chase for sponsors uh, we managed to, to gather funding to make this work possible and we dubbed it as a GDAL born effort. So what does Project X work, uh, does? Uh, it now managed WKT, uh, which was previously in GDAL. Um, so it managed all uh, the variants you can find in the wild, the S3. Uh, WKT, the WKT1 variant that was used by GDAL M2 now, and the two variant of WKT2, the 2015, and the latest version that has just been published like 10 days ago, the uh, 2019 version. Uh, it also implements uh, C++ class hierarchy, implementing the OGC abstract topic 2 uh, model. So we have now proper modelization of CRS object in Proj. And this was quite a substantial effort because the number of lines of code in Proj has doubled before and after this effort. Uh, another aspect is that instead of uh, using CSV files, we now use uh, SQLite database, so it offers better query cap capabilities and we can integrate in a seamless way uh, several catalogs from uh, EPSG, S3, uh, uh, the French National and, uh, Geographic Institute, and maybe soon we will we'll have also the in, uh, in International Astronomic uh, uh, CRS uh, database. Uh, it implements a late binding CRS uh, transformation approach I mentioned before, that is the capability to directly use transformation from the source to the target CRS instead of going through WGS84 systematically. Uh, it can make use of area of uses because when you have two CRS, you can have different transformation 
according to the place where you are. If you're in the United States, you can have a transformation per uh, state, for example. And it also has better uh, temporal uh, handling with a new concept like uh, dynamic datums and datum ensembles. Um, so a new utility has been uh, added per info, and I strongly recommend you, you use it if you want really to understand what, C what CRS transformation are done because uh, it will uh, give you the number of steps and which steps there are and the, their accuracy. Uh, so for example, here at the bottom, I transform between GDR 94 and GDR 2020 and it tells me that five possible transformation with a name and their accuracy and you, you can get, get more details here, it's just, just a summary. Uh, no, a little question for you. You see this broad string and can you tell me which CRS it is supposed to represent? Come on. Because I am pretty sure you have seen it a lot of times. No? Okay, so this one can be used for all these CRS. So ETRS 99 in Europe, the Australian Datum, the Japanese Datum, the New Zealand Datum, Datum in North America, in Latin America, and many, many others. So proj strings to represent CRS are really a no-go in this new uh, uh, approach, uh, this late binding approach, because uh, they don't encode uh, the datum information. or I mean, they encode a transformation to WGS84, which can be clearly suboptimal uh, in use cases. So instead of using them, use EPSD codes or WKT, and in the uh, version of Project 6.2 that is going to, to be released in a few days, uh, you can use uh, what we have called ProJSON, which is a JSON encoding of WKT2. So you have a, a number of options now to, to convey CRS as strings. Uh, regarding work that has been done in GDAL, so Project 6 is now uh, a required dependency. Um, up to now, it used to be a, a recommended, a strongly recommended. Uh, <laughs> Uh, dependency, but not it's required. Uh, so all the WKT support code is now uh, down in, in Proj itself. So it brings uh, capability to under WKT2. And actually, WKT2 deployment in the wild was uh, a bit uh, hindered by the fact that GDAL didn't under it. So now, uh, clearly, WKT2 can usage can uh, raise a lot. Uh, we no longer have any CSV file related to uh, CRS, and so you now the GDAL database for CRS is a proj database. Uh, so everything is centralized now. We have the capability to do time-dependent coordinate operation if you deal with uh, dynamic datums, uh, where the coordinate must be uh, accompanied with a, a coordinate epoch. Uh, you can specify this coordinate epoch to have really a precise transformation. Uh, we have this new CT switch, uh, which has been added to the OGR, to OGR and GDAL warp utilities, and it enables you to specify the exact coordinate uh, transformation pipeline as a, as a proj uh, string, uh, and you will typically get it from the proj info utility I just mentioned before. So this is clearly an advanced uh, switch when you want to precisely uh, control uh, which uh, coordinate transformation you do. And uh, yeah, last item, uh, which yeah, a number of people will consider more as a, as a bug than a feature, is that the EPSG axis order is now enforced at the low level by default. That means if you use uh, EPSG 3, 4, 2, 6, uh, the first uh, component of the coordinate tuple will be the latitude. So that can that you must be aware of that if you use the lower uh, services of GDAL. In GDAL 3, uh, uh, it has switched to EPSG axis order by default. And we have some uh, 
um, parameters to use a traditional G GIS order because it's still uh, convenient in a lot of situations. Regarding libgeotif, uh, projects is now a required dependency. It no longer uh, uses any CSV file and it just queries a proj database when it needs to resolve uh, an object like an ellipsoid definition from its code. Uh, regarding the adoption of this, so we had uh, versions of Pro, GDAL, and LibGeotif uh, since the first semester of this year. And uh, Pro 6 uh, API is being used by a number of projects. So uh, QG 3.8 uh, is now using Pro 6 capabilities, uh, the new version of GRASS. Pro 3 uh, will also be able to use it. Poodle 2, which has been released a few days ago, also uses Pro 6. Uh, Map Server 8 will use Proj 6 too, and we have a wiki page uh, where you can find the adoption status of uh, all these packages. And I've seen recently that uh, Debian is uh, transitioning to Proj 6, so Proj 6 and GDAR 3 will be soon in the uh, latest uh, Debian uh, distribution. So I must thank, of course, all the sponsors of the GDAL Barn effort because without them, it, would, it wouldn't have been possible. And that's all. So. <laughs> so any questions? Uh, I remember that there were some old Esri well-known ID numbers that were somewhere in those CSV files that kind of helped map data that used those well-known ID numbers. Have those been put into the SQLite database? Uh, yes, we actually, S3 uh, as a GitHub repository where they publish uh, all their uh, CRS and transformation database. And this has been completely uh, pulled in as a project database. So you will find uh, all the S3 uh, current and even deprecated code in it. Other question? Uh, is there a mechanism in place to specify where the database is located? Sure, there are even several ones. So you have this projlib uh, environment variable that has been used for years or decades, <laughs> and you also have a, an API call, uh, proj uh, set database pass, or something like that. Okay. Other question? Is there epoch information in the EPSG database, or is that coming for the uh, Sorry, epoch? the time information for the for the datums uh, yeah time time support in the epsg database is slowly uh, going into the database and uh, actually they are going to do a major change in their uh, data model in the few months uh, for the the end of this year normally they will release a, a new data model where they will probably have more uh, support for temporal data. Um, I'm currently working with a reference system for which there is no EPSG code, and I contact the EPSG and they don't, don't even reply, so I guess there will never be one. Is there any possibility of having this reference system inserted into the new project database? So, uh, yeah, technically, there is no issue to, to add a, a new CRS uh, definition. Uh, I mean, the database is, is quite, uh, yeah, structure is uh, I mean, valid for any CRS definition. So, we can technically do that. 
I think we don't really want to become a proj CRS authority because, uh, yeah, Christian there said, no, don't do that. Uh, because, yeah, it's, it's a tough job, I mean, to assert if a CRS definition is a, is a correct one uh, or not. So it would be more on a case, case by case, uh, yeah. I would say first try with EPSG to see if they want uh, to accept. Well, you try then, yeah, maybe in that case we can consider it if if it suffers uh, of sufficient uh, general interest to, I mean. Some other authority like Esri or somebody like that because those are pulled in too. Yeah, but yeah, when you define something you need yeah, to have some expert knowledge to know if the, uh, yeah, I, I, I have contacts with uh, a person at, at EPSG, and, and they say that sometimes they re, uh, receive contribution from different agencies, and sometimes they say, well, uh, you provided with us with scrap. I mean, your Sarah's definition is wrong. Just fix it first. So you really need strong expertise to, to know if the Sarah's definition is good. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and also, yeah, if you contact Esri, like, they love putting new coordinate systems in, I find. Uh, one thing, you said no prod strings, but there still is prod string support, right? Yeah, we couldn't remove it. <laughs> it would just have been a nightmare for everyone using prod to know, so it's still there, uh, but it's clearly a deprecated way to encode a CRS, so... I mean, if you considered using the new project API, you sh should also consider storing your CRS definition in WKT, or if you know the APSG code, just store it. It's much more reliable and uh, it has much more content that uh, will enable Proj to find the appropriate transformation. Um, let's say I'm developing uh, some lightweight um, embedded application and I always know the coordinate systems I'll be tra transforming between. Uh, is it possible to uh, not use this whole server machinery to always specify the you know, uh, sequence of transformations I'll be using? Um. <laughs> Well, you would need to do a custom build, I guess, to, for example, strip out uh, or the uh, method, uh, projection method you don't know. Or you can just look at the source code and extract the few lines of maths you need. And if you're really constrained by the size, it, it would probably be the better option. I know that some people have used uh, WebAssembly uh, to transpile uh, Code, uh, approach to uh, for the browser, so it's technically doable. I don't know how it performs, but people have tried it. I have used WebAssembly, and on this topic of lightweight, I'm a bit concerned about the, the C++. So we use the C API from the approach 4, so now this is all C++ only, right? So I have a dependency on the C++ standard library and this linkage issue between different compilers is much more difficult than with C compilers, so this is a big concern for me with the new version. Uh, yes, so there's still a C API. Uh, still yeah, but yeah, C++ is a uh, uh, required dependency to build new projects. Plus bindings to a C API because this is such a, a critical core functionality of the whole geo stack. It, it would make a lot of sense to me to to do it. The, and I, I'd volunteer to do it if, if you were. So, so you stuff. you say you volunteer to rewrite the C plus plus stuff into C or? On top of the C, <laughs> up, up top of the C. So, rewrite the C plus plus into C. Then have the same classes calling the C bindings. This this calling the C core. Basically, flipping it, the, the classic way to do it with the C++ classes as bindings to the C code. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's uh, it's a huge effort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's so critical because when you compare to WebAssembly, now with the C++ dependency, it's going to make your your WebAssembly so much bigger than the mm -hmm. core version. So that means lower load time, longer. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer to this. Yeah, that's. Yeah, we can we we can talk to that uh, later. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, all the speakers, and thank you all for coming to this session. I hope you enjoyed. And now enjoy the coffee break. See you later. <laughs>